Good, noon, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Katie Boone. I'm the Marketing Manager for the NSF ISR Division here at NSF International. I want to thank you for joining us for today's webinar where, you, where we are going to discuss the topic of competence. I would like to introduce you to today's speaker. Don McFarland is our Aerospace Technical Scheme Manager. Don was born into aerospace at the U.S. Air Force Academy Hospital and has been around it ever since. He's been involved in third-party auditing for 10-plus years, and with NSF for the last three years, currently is serving as technical manager for the aerospace group. To just mention a couple um, details before we get started today, during this webinar, I'm going to put everybody on mute. Um, you're going to use the chat function over on the left-hand side to ask any questions, and it's encouraged to do so because we do have some time at the end of the webinar to do Q&A. Please use the chat function. Everyone that has registered for the event will be receiving a copy of the slides as well as a recording of the webinar itself. So you can look out for that for the, in this week and you'll be getting that from me. Um, thank you again for joining us. Really do appreciate your support for NSF ISR. And Don, if you're ready to get started, go ahead and take it away. Sorry, I couldn't get to the mute button fast enough here. Uh, welcome everybody for the next installment of our webinar series. Um, for those that have joined us on the, the call, make sure you're uh, following along on the slide and on the audio side, and we'll uh, be answering the questions as Katie mentioned towards the end of the presentation. Um, today, as usual, we'll start off by doing a brief poll, and uh, given the spirit of confidence as the uh, the topic today, I wanted to ask the question, has your organization ever hired the wrong candidate? Have you ever hired the quote unquote wrong candidate? So if you go ahead, everybody click the button. And it's a completely anonymous poll. Don't worry about giving away the secret sauce or anything exciting like that. We're just looking to find out how widespread of a problem this is. And five, four, three, two, and one. Thank you, everybody. And the overwhelming answer is, of course, uh, we've all hired the wrong candidate. Now, the next question associated with this poll is, did it work out? Did they stick around? Are they a productive member of the organization? And did, did, uh, did they make a meaningful impact to the organization? So we'll give you just a couple seconds here to fill that out. And really, it's either yes or no. Uh, and then the no's have some timelines associated with how long they hung around or if they're still here. Give everybody just a couple more seconds to finish this one. In five, four, three, two, and one. So overwhelmingly, the answer is no, they didn't work out. And it's kind of jaded based on uh, the number of responses here for divvied up amongst the no's. But I have three yeses of the 21 people that have said uh, or that have responded. So three out of 21 said it worked out. The, the remaining people said no. And you'll notice that a majority of them are, uh, took more than a year for them to exit. And in, that, in the meantime, they had a pretty lasting impact on the organization, whether it be in terms of morale, in terms of the uh, replacement costs, et cetera. There's a, a significant impact there. So we're going to get on to the topic of uh, competence and, and employees, human resources, and uh, we're going to focus on just the standards take on it. But I wanted to really set the stage here from a quote uh, from uh, one of my favorite authors, Jim Collins. He wrote the Good to Great series. He said, people are not your most important asset, the right people are. So it's important that we not only have bodies to fill seats, but we have the right people in those seats. Because if we don't have the right candidate, we don't have a vetting process that's capable of hiring that right candidate, uh, we're going to be wasting a lot of time uh, both in, in trying to manage that personality and in trying to um, overcome the shortcomings that, that uh, exist as a result of that. So we'll talk more about that. Um, the next as usual, go through the agenda, transition plan benchmarks. Transition plan benchmarks are uh, really unchanged. We have um, 
9.15 of 18 is the deadline. Uh, there's some recent clarifications from the Supplemental Rule 003, and essentially it says um, that there may possibly be some extensions, but if you read the fine print, it says expiration dates are expiration dates, and really all it's allowed is if you do expire, you don't have to go through a Stage 1, Stage 2. You still require additional time. It's going to be painful. Stick to the, the thought process of my cert expires September 14th, and I need to have my audit done. Don't read into it. Um, it's not going to be as forgiving as some people think it is. Uh, we just need to stick to that September 14th deadline. Um, we may have some case-by-case -case exceptions to that, but really the industry has said September 14th is the deadline, September 15th, the old standards, right off into the sunset. So that's the extent of that. Um, as far as the competence definitions, I want to cover three different sections from the standard. Those three sections are going to be primarily the competence piece from Section 7.2. And again, as we know, 9001 is the foundation for the AS series. Um, and even though it says AS9100, it's AS9100 series, the 9100, 9110, 9120 uh, from the 2015 9001 and the 2016 series of the AS documents. So under Section 7.2, it says the organization shall determine the necessary competence of persons doing work under its control that affect the performance and effectiveness of the quality management system. And letter B, ensure that these persons are competent on the basis of education, training, or experience. Uh, letter C, where applicable, take actions to acquire the necessary competence and evaluate the effectiveness of the actions taken. And then letter D, retain appropriate documented information as evidence of competence. So one of the takeaways I want to highlight as we go through this section is how many times does it mention the word training as opposed to competence? If we look here, training is cited right here versus competence is mentioned here, here, uh, here, here, et cetera, here. Um, that's because w this section has a, a common misnomer in training. It really is competence. We're, we're trying to determine the competence of personnel. A component of competence is certainly training, and we'll get more into that here in a moment. But I wanted to highlight that as a, as a pretty important point. Um, another key thing I want to highlight is the note. And the note here from the aerospace standard, and we can tell that because it's bold italicized text, says consideration should be given for the periodic review of necessary competence. Now, as we know, notes are not auditable. So as an auditor, I'm not going to hold you accountable for those. But notes do provide clarification for you as an organization to help you understand what's intended by a particular clause. So it's telling us we should be doing or we should consider periodic review of necessary competence. And we'll talk more about what that could look like. Another note here from the ISO side is applicate, or applicable actions can include, for example, the provision of training, the mentoring of, or the reassignment of current, uh, currently employed persons or the hiring or contracting of competent persons. So this is essentially pairing the right person up with the job, making sure that we have the right skill sets in place to perform the tasks that are needed by the organization. Um, if you have any questions, again, through the, uh, the conversation that we have, anything that you don't want to hold towards the end, just put it in that chat function and we will be happy to address those towards the end of it, okay? Um, the section, second section of the standard that I want to talk to is section 712, and this is uh, people is what the name of it is. It's essentially the human resources side, right? Everything under section 7 is support, 7.1 is the resources, 7.1.2 is the people resources or the human resources associated with uh, the organization. So specifically when it talks to people, it says the organization shall determine and provide the persons necessary for the effective implementation of its QMS and for the operation and control of its processes. So we have to have people. We have to ensure that we have people that are performing the effective implementation and operation and control of the processes. And again, to do that, we use competent people, because we have to determine the competence of persons doing work under the control of the organization, right? So there's a direct tie between the resources 
or the human resources, the people, and the necessary uh, competence associated with those. One other clause that I wanted to go through um, as a part of this introductory section is organizational knowledge. Um, I'm a firm believer that organizational knowledge is something we've done for a lot of years, but it's something that we don't necessarily take credit for, but it's absolutely paramount uh, given our current position uh, um, as a society. We have a number of boomers that are looking to retire. Um, the, to put generational labels on people, millennials are not entering the workforce fast enough to replace those positions, and there's a number of impending um, retirements uh, that are that are upcoming uh, that are just not going to be capable of being filled. So we're going to have a ton of knowledge that exits with all of those retirements and that we've already lost with all those retirements, and we won't have any crossover time with the replacement persons to to gain that knowledge. So the, the purpose of this organizational knowledge is to capture the quote-unquote OJT, the competence piece associated with tasks that are being performed, so that we don't have to learn the same lessons again. And while the OJT is a component of this, it, as it relates to competence, it's a pretty important component of this. Um, so I want to focus on the organizational knowledge for just a moment. It says the organization shall determine the necessary knowledge for the operation of its processes and to achieve conformity of products and services maintained and available to the extent necessary. And when addressing the change, uh, changing needs and trends, the organization shall consider its current knowledge and determine how to acquire or access any necessary additional knowledge and required updates. So now if we think about that organizational knowledge as it relates to the competence piece, we have to determine the necessary competence, which could definitely include that organizational knowledge, those changing needs and, and issues, right? So we need to make sure that we're considering a tie between the competence uh, the training, the education, skills, experience that we have within our workforce and the organizational knowledge that may be leaving or that we can glean from other competing organizations um, as we go. Some implementation thoughts associated with those. Uh, again, I kind of alluded to this earlier, competence versus training. Uh, oftentimes as an auditor, I walk into an organization, they say, do you want to see the training records? or um, you know, auditors will ask, can I see your records of training? And in reality, what we're after is not necessarily the records of training. We're after the evidence, the documented information that's been retained per letter D here to show that this candidate is competent to perform the task. Now, the question is, who determines competence or what competence entails? And, of course, the standard provides that up here in letter A. It says the organization shall determine the necessary competence of persons doing work under its control. And then it says under letter B, we need to be competent on the basis of appropriate education, training, or experience. Now, as we remember from the old standard, they broke it down even further and said education, training, skills, and experience. So we had a couple other components that were, were included. But under the current standard, it essentially breaks it down into those three categories and says education, training, or experience. So we're looking for not only records of training or retained documented information to show that training is appropriate, we're looking for retained appropriate documented information to show that the education of the candidate matches the necessary competence that's been determined by the organization. Likewise, their experience matches the necessary competence as determined by the organization. Now, is it possible to hire the perfect candidate every time? As we did demonstrated through that poll, the answer is no. In fact, rarely do we get the proper candidate or the appropriate candidate, right? Um, and again, that could be tied to the workforce availability. That could be tied to our willingness to pay for it or something else or a combination thereof. But what the standard says is we determine what competence equals, we ensure that they meet it, and then if they're not meeting that definition, we take appropriate action to ensure that they acquire the necessary competence and then evaluate the actions taken to ensure that they were effective. So 
we could be providing them additional training. Maybe it's sharing some resources and, and sending them to an on-the-job activity or sharing them with a different division so that they can acquire a skill set that they lacked as a part of the defined confidence that was determined for their position. Okay? So I think that covers the little bit of what's expected there. Again, we're not looking for training. Training is a component to competence, but it's not all of competence. Competence equals appropriate education, training, or experience as determined by the organization because we have to determine what competence equals for persons doing work. Now, another caveat I want to throw or another clarification I want to throw in here, it says persons doing work under its control that affect the performance and effectiveness of the quality management system. Now, what does that entail? Uh, I get asked on occasion, does my janitor affect the performance and the effectiveness of the quality management system? And the answer is, it depends. Because if that janitor is a part of our FOD management or foreign object debris management program and they're responsible to ensure that my workplace is clean and free of uh, foreign material that's going to cause harm to my product or my process, then absolutely they have an impact. If they're simply scrubbing toilets, they may not have as big of a meaningful impact towards the quality management system. So it's going to sincerely depend on what their role is within the organization and the impact that they're going to make on your service or your deliverable to your customer, to your interested parties, as the standard puts it. Okay? So with that, we'll get into the components of competence. Again, education, experience, and training are really the three components that are mentioned in the, the standard now, right? So typically that education comes prior. The experience is something that comes prior, and we gauge those based on the interview process or the resume or that, that vetting of the candidate's process. And I'm not an HR professional, and I won't tend to, to be, but I'll tell you there is a very – a very good methodology associated with ensuring that candidates meet the required competence through that, that human resources function. And oftentimes they've got a great mechanism for defining that through maybe a job description or a position description or a posting. And then we do an interview to ensure that they have the technical aptitude, they have the experience, they have the, the uh, resume, if you will, the CV that, that, qualifies them to get in the door. They go through an interview process to ensure that they're um, personality-wise, they're a good mesh with the organization, and all of that stuff is taken to um, ensure that we've got the right candidate um, the right candidate brought on or brought into the mix. Um, are they going to be perfect? As we've seen, the answer is no. So that's where we do this evaluation through the hiring process, and we determine where the gaps are. Nobody's perfect. There's always going to be gaps. And it, even if we do find a candidate that's appropriate for our organization, those gaps may certainly include our required compliance training for statutory and regulatory, whether it be the OSHAs or uh, safety and health for the, the province or the state authorities, um, or it could be our, you know, our security procedures our corporate ethics training, et cetera, et cetera. There's always going to be something that we've got to supplement their past experience with to make sure that they're brought up to the, the minimum level needed for our organization, right? We're qualifying them based on their education, their experience, and their prior training, and then we're going to identify what gaps exist. We create that gap plan associated with their specific situation and then we provide the necessary training to get them up to that point. Now, if we hire a candidate off the street to run a CNC, it, are they going to have prior education, prior experience? Maybe not. So our GAP program, our training plan, is going to be much more significant, much more in-depth to get them to a point where they are competent, right? Um, some examples of this may be, the, again, the company-specific statutory regulatory type documentation or training. Or it may be just professional development. It may be ongoing training that needs to be scheduled. Maybe it's an auditor course associated with an updated standard or a new standard that they haven't been exposed to. Um, all of these things should be considered as a part of that, ensuring that this candidate has the proper education, experience, and training needed to meet the position's needs, the competence subset of that position 
as defined through your program, whether it's a training matrix, a job description, or a position description. Something defines it. We need to ensure that we meet that definition. And, of course, we need to have records, or as the new standard puts it, uh, documented information, retained documented information. And I'm going to talk to that in just a moment. First, I want to address OJT. Is on-the-job training permitted? And, of course, the answer is yes, because it's going to be absolutely important for us to learn from experienced staff. But we cannot rely on everyone to be an acceptable trainer. Because teaching bad habits could be absolutely worse than teaching nothing at all. If we're teaching somebody to do it wrong, are we doing ourselves any favors? We need to ensure that we're enlisting the right trainers, the right people to perform that on-the-job training. And then we need to have some evaluation associated with that to make sure that it's stuck, that they're performing it appropriately and they're not learning those bad habits as they're being left alone for the first time, right? So developing some sort of mentoring program when we have those skills that just can't be learned from the book. The last bullet here says evidence. What sort of evidence exists as a part of an on-the-job training program or this, this you know, in-the-field type training? And, and it could be simple as a uh, training record that shows the amount of contact hours they had with their trainer. It could be an evaluation sheet from that contact person. It could be um, an evaluation or a performance evaluation that's performed on a monthly or quarterly basis, or maybe it's a skill sign-off associated with tasks that need to be performed while they're doing it. Now, I'm going to revert back to my fire, uh, fire department side real quick. Uh, for those that have joined us before, you may know that I, I do fire department things on the side. And anytime I sign a new candidate off, we have a very significant check ride process where they have to demonstrate, even if they have 25 years of experience, they have to demonstrate basic skills like putting on their air tank and putting up a ladder, pulling a hose, because those are all things that we as a company, we as a department, we as a fire brigade need to be confident that this candidate can do before we are willing to sign them off as being able to perform those tasks um, in the heat of the moment. So we have a, a check sheet that they have to sign off and there are skill sheets associated with those check sheets they have to perform to that define the minimum criteria associated with executing the skill along with the conditions and the timeline or the timing allowed. And then there's a record that's maintained to show that this candidate performed it on this date and it was acceptable. Now, is it a one and done? Absolutely not. Those candidates are tested for six months as part of their probationary process they can be drilled, and they know this, they can be drilled on any one of those skills by anybody throughout the course of the day at a moment's notice. Um, now, obviously, that same sort of uh, skill set doesn't translate to the work necessarily because you can't expect somebody to drop what they're doing and go, uh, you know, discharge a fire extinguisher. But they should be competent and capable of performing a task or walking through a task and articulating it to a supervisor hitting the highlights associated with the procedure. If our procedures aren't clearly defined well enough, maybe we need to take that into consideration and, and develop that process so that we can ensure consistency through that on-the-job training and that the, uh, the trainers know the highlights or the important pieces that need to be conveyed through that training process. In addition, we need to make sure that we've got some mechanism to um, evaluate the trainers so that we can ensure that they're they're performing the, the, uh, the training task, the, the um, conveyance of information uh, in a manner that's acceptable to your, your company, um, that, that we're not putting them in, in a bad situation by not giving them the resources they need or um, by having them convey inappropriate information to the candidates. Um, all of these would be captured in evidence, right? These are all things that we need to consider. Um, the next slide talks about evaluating the competence, and this is really where um, I give you some, some basic ideas or basic thoughts on what those retained documented information articles could be. Um, the, the verification of the competence piece from the standard side 
Um, and it's not talking about the AS or ISO standard. It's saying more of this is oftentimes what we see is some sort of description associated with the position and the detailing out what the candidate needs to have, what they need to um, have from an education standpoint, from an experience standpoint, and maybe from a skills standpoint. And HR, the human resources group of your company, may have those defined. It's going to be pretty important that the QMS definitions sync up with the HR definitions because, as we've seen, there's a direct tie here, right? So even though you may have a, a human resources group that does, quote, unquote, their own thing, as an auditor, that's something I'm going to be interested in. I'm going to be looking at to assure myself that you are following that that description because that really becomes a part of the, the definition of competency associated with that candidate. Now, how do I do that? I'm going to take that job description or whatever position description or training matrix that's been defined to show what the candidate needs, and then I'm going to be looking at the evidence that's been collected through the hiring process, through the ongoing evaluation, maybe through training courses or for, through competency reviews, and make sure that all of the requirements that have been defined have been met. Um, and if there are gaps that exist, that you've got a program in place or a plan defined to help address those gaps, to mitigate the risk associated with those gaps. Um, some examples here through the hiring process may be interview notes. So as we bring the candidate in to conduct the interview, we've got some ability to, to gather the thoughts of the interviewers and make sure that they can show that the person has good interpersonal skills or good um, personal contact or they, they have the ability to um, interface well with people, some of those soft or intangible skills, right, something that's not necessarily captured in a resume. Um, we also have the resume or the CV that's going to help to demonstrate the work history. It's going to demonstrate the experience piece. It may include some references. It may include certifications. So that could definitely be retained documented information associated with uh, capturing the competence or uh, demonstrating that the competence has been met. We may also need to get copies of certificates or degrees. Uh, we may need to interview the uh, references. Again, it's going to depend on the level of the position, the desire to go through this from a company standpoint. Of course, cost plays into it. But as we know, hiring the right candidate up front is pretty important, and we save ourselves a ton of money and a ton of time by doing a, a more thorough vetting of the candidates up front so that we're not wasting time by hiring the wrong candidate and waiting for them to weed themselves out. So going through that hiring process, we collect all that information, and, and that will demonstrate that it's been uh, the candidate fits um, through an ongoing performance review. Um, we're going to demonstrate that the candidate's continuing to, to meet the requirements and maybe the, the dynamic requirements. These positions do change. They do morph over time. So we, we use this as a means to address the gaps that may have come up from that, that modified description. Or as they continue to grow, we can use this as a means to, to tell the story of they were uh, unsatisfactory and now are satisfactory. And we want them to continue to grow into this position through this additional training. So we've defined what the ongoing competency outlooks, outlook looks like for this candidate um, in the interest of maybe forward progress, forward planning, succession management, okay? Uh, for training courses, there's usually some sort of testing or some evaluation associated with it to make sure that the candidate is, is capable of retaining the, the information that's been deployed or that the, the learning objectives have been met, right? So we define the, the objectives associated with a training course. Um, we use some sort of an evaluation, whether it's a written test or a performance-based test. Um, there's some way to determine that they've captured, retained, uh, understood the knowledge that's been conveyed to them. Um, that may be a one and done, or it may be necessary to do it at an immediate stand, or from an immediate standpoint and then an, on an ongoing basis. Um, to ensure that they're continuing to follow those prescribed methods. Um, the last one on here that I mentioned is competency reviews, and I, I used a couple acronyms. OSB, it's a Boeing term for operator self-verification, and then AAM, ex, uh, acceptance authority media, another Boeing term. It's an industry term, but Boeing is really uh, pushing that down through the supply chain, as are a couple other primes. 
Um, those become important because we need to verify that a person who has a stamp or has the authority to sign off on particular tasks, they have a particular competence set that's required of them. We could also throw DSQR, supplier delegations, um, into this. If I have a delegation from my customer associated with performing an inspection on their behalf, I need to ensure that my competence requirements have been met for performing that delegation or that delegated inspection. And as a result, I probably need to do some sort of reviews to make sure that I'm still continuing to follow down that path. Um, the same would be true for NDT examiners, right? If I'm, if I'm a level one, level two associated with NDT, I have to do ongoing training to make sure that I'm following the, the, the correct methodologies, following the correct processes, and able to see the, the indications that manifest through that process. So these are all different ways to evaluate candidates against the criteria that have been set forth for them and assure that they are continuing to meet the competency requirements. In addition, we can do this through our internal audit activity. We can assure ourselves that the candidate is performing to the requirements through the internal audit activity based on them following the process, based on them executing to the requirements, and uh, a reasonable output at the end of that process. So that is um, the extent of the commentary that I have here. Now I'm going to go into some more implementation, or excuse me, the, the reviewer commentary, some editorial type stuff, as opposed to the thoughts that I had there. The, the editorial portion here is um, hiring the correct person saves, uh, may cost more in the short term, but can definitely save money over the long term. As we've seen, hiring the wrong candidate is something that many, many, many organizations are plagued with. And there's a significant cost associated with hiring a candidate and having them stay, or hiring a candidate and having them leave after time, because we lose that time. We lose productivity, and oftentimes it impacts morale during that period as well. So we can not only lose that candidate, but we could lose maybe a couple other productive members of society because they're unable to stick it out through the torture of having, having a, a bad peer, of having an, the inappropriate candidate in that position. Um, a well-defined and properly executed program for performance improvement is vital. The, the point I was trying to make with that bullet is once I hire a candidate, I've got a rigorous methodology associated with identifying their gaps and executing the necessary training or, or on-the-job training or reevaluation to assure that they are coming up to speed. They are achieving competence in a defined manner so that we're bringing them up to become a productive member of the organization. We're not going to hire the correct candidate. Or no, it's going to be very difficult for us to find the perfect candidate. We're going to find the one that's the best fit for our organization. If we can find the one that has, you know, all of the bells and whistles that we're looking for, great. Chances are we're not going to find them, but we need to make sure that they're, we define what they're going to need to get there. Um, going through a thorough vetting process is going to be key so that we can identify what gaps exist to the necessary competence that we've defined as an organization. The next slide talks about capturing lessons learned. Um, again, this kind of ties into that, that uh, organizational knowledge piece and the exodus of, of workers. And I'm not talking mass exodus as a result of layoffs or anything like that, although that should be considered. What I'm talking about is as we lose experience, we lose lessons learned. We need to assure ourselves that we're capturing those lessons learned so that we don't make the same mistake, we learn from it, and we don't repeat it. The same would be true of our hiring process. If we fail in hiring a good candidate, we need to analyze it. We need to own up to it. We need to figure out how we fix it to make it better. And I'm here to tell you money is not always the answer. Money definitely helps, but money does not solve all the problems in the world. So we need to identify what's broken in the process that's causing us to maybe not define the requirements up front or maybe not define the gap 
the gaps that exist or execute to those gaps so that we can bring a candidate up to the necessary competence. Um, along with that, we probably need to have a, a good process associated with conveying um, the lessons learned through that ongoing process so that we're, we're reinforcing history within that person or that organizational knowledge within the person so that they're able to use that as part of their, their baseline criteria, their evaluation criteria for situations they encounter, right? We can definitely talk to a, a person about you know, what happened in the past, but if we don't reinforce that as a part of the, um, the competency process, as part of that gap addressing process, then we're, we're probably not going to have it stick. Um, the last slide that I have here talks to the importance of leadership. Um, and the reason I put that is because I, I go into organizations often where I see a, a good worker or a good uh, soldier is promoted into a sergeant role or a good soldier is promoted into a, a, a general's role. And as we know, good work ethic doesn't always translate to good leader. Um, some people are perfectly happy being that, that effective senior person and, and don't necessarily want to be people leaders. And we need to make sure that we're not pigeonholing them into that position based on the money, based on, you know, they're the senior guy. We want to make sure that we have good leadership in place because if we don't have good leaders, we won't be capable of identifying skill gaps, of identifying um, the, the succession management programs, the, the, the plans associated with executing tasks and the necessary competence for those people. Um, if I, as a leader, can't recognize the shortcomings in my people, then I can't fill those shortcomings or address those shortcomings or reassign them to the tasks where we don't exploit those. Um, and, and it will definitely impact our mission. It will impact our ability to manage the process. So leadership will definitely have a tie on the management of the process or the outcome of the process. And we need to make sure that we're investing in our leaders and not necessarily, again, not pigeonholing those good workers into becoming good generals. Um, that's really all I had for this section. Again, the, the intent here was to talk from a high level from generalities associated with the standard on what the standard entails, and I wanted to break the, the mindset that the standard talks to training. The, the standard talks to competence, and training is a subset of competence, but we need to make sure we're addressing all of that other stuff uh, associated with competence and having a robust plan to assure that we're bringing the right resources in and executing that competence program so that we bring them to a level where they're capable um, and, and doing so in a manner that's going to help our mission. And if we're not, we need to have a good program for exiting those candidates because they're not in a good fit, whether it's reassigning them to other duties or maybe uh, helping them to find new jobs um, because not everybody is a good fit for every organization. So this is an opportunity for you to type some questions into that Q&A bar. We're going to go through a couple more slides here, and then I'm going to start answering questions as they come up. Um, please feel free to type those in, um, and I'll uh, introduce a few resources here where the information for this webinar came from and some other resources that you'll be able to access. Uh, one in particular I want to highlight is the NSF ISR resources. These are, this is our web page associated with the um, webinars. We've got now, I think, 18 or 19 of them that we've de developed and, and executed. Uh, all of these are free to anybody that wants them. Feel free to download them, share them, use them, whatever. Um, you get to them through this NSF ISR, or excuse me, NSF.org uh, info ISO updates page. And then under that AS9100 tab, there is the webinar series. You click on the hyperlink that's a part of that and it will take you to all of the webinars that are there. You enter your contact information. Really, all that does is get you on the mailing list for future webinars. Um, so Katie can contact you for any opportunities that come up. And then from there, you'll be able to uh, get access to any of the information that we have uh, prepared for you. 
Um, the next slide shows more of the IEQG resources that exist. Uh, there's the Supply Chain Management Handbook. Great resource, great free resource. Please go look at it, download some of the information there. If you have any questions about any facet of the uh, aerospace or even the QMS, um, please, please, please use that resource. It's a wonderful source of information. The other one I want to point you to here is the IEQG standard questions. Um, this is a resource associated with maybe communications or clarifications, FAQs. All of that type of information is going to be found on this IEQG standard clarifications page. Uh, it's broken down by standard, and you'll be able to get access to all of the information there. Um, that's where a lot of these Q&As uh, or the responses to the Q&As come from, uh, either via email that you'll send me later or through these webinars. We define them based on clarifications or information that's been published from industry through these sources. So wonderful resources. If you have free time, please, please, please go look at them. Um, the next slide I have is our contact information. Mike McGrandall was unable to join us today, but he's our business unit manager for the aerospace group. He's actually in a 9104-3 rewrite meeting up in Montreal, uh, Montreal, working with the team, writing the auditor competency document for the next generation. Um, so he, he apologizes for not being able to make it, but that was a pretty important thing for him to get involved in so that we can assure ourselves of having competent auditors and a methodology for future growth of our auditor pool, because as we know, that's been kind of a shortfall for CBs um, based on the vetting criteria for auditors. So he's, he's actively involved in that process and trying to make sure that we've got a dog in the fight and getting good candidates and qualifying folks that have nece haven't necessarily been qualified in the past based on that work experience requirement that exists. So um, he apologizes again, but this is our contact information. The last thing I want to ask for before I start answering the questions is uh, for our July topic. We have not decided, and the reason for that is I want to hear from you guys if there's something that you want us to talk about or a topic that you are interested in, please email me, please email Mike, please email Katie and let us know what sort of things we can talk about, what sort of things you're interested in, what needs you have, um, how we can help as a company. And if you send that email to either of these email addresses, we'll make sure that we're addressing that, uh, building it into future webinar series. So I'm going to leave this, this uh, slide up so you can get our contact information while I go through and address the uh, questions that have been asked up to this point. Uh, so the first question I have here, it's uh, already been answered by Katie, but it's will we be able to get a copy of the training materials? And the answer is absolutely. Um, within about a week, usually, Katie has the ability to uh, render the video, make it make it work for the uh, media that we we use, and she'll send the links out to that, that video, and then she'll send out presentations, uh, typically in a PDF format, if I'm not mistaken, so that everybody who's attended has access or everybody that's registered has access uh, to these materials. If you want different copies or if you want to use them for internal use, um, feel free to use the recorded session or feel free to take the materials. Nothing here is proprietary to NSF. Really the intent, again, is to make sure that we're qualifying, or excuse me, that we're, that we're calibrating our candidates, we're calibrating our auditors, we're calibrating our clients, on what's expected, what the requirements of the standard are, um, really so that we can educate everybody at the same time and ensure that we're all on the same page as to why we do what we do and what the requirements truly are. So please, if you have any questions on that, let us know. Um, next question, can you give us some examples of how to capture lessons learned and retrieve them easily later? Absolutely. Um, typically what I see there is either through our risks and opportunities tool, whether it be an FMEA or some log book, we're capturing all of the lessons learned or we're capturing um, situations that have been uncovered and we uh, record those. Now if we're using that traditional FMEA type approach, a line on the FMEA is entered. For those that don't know, FMEA, Failure Mode Effects Analysis, it's a risk register if you will. Um, by the way, I'm not, I'm not an advocate for the traditional FMEA with the RPNs and everything. For most organizations, it's way too complex and we can get sidetracked by the scoring mechanisms of 
let alone the the RPN threshold. Um, I'm a fan of a more simplistic approach. And if you watch the risk register or the risk analysis, risk-based thinking webinar, you'll you'll hear more about this. But really, what we care about is what is the risk? What is the opportunity? Is it actionable? If so, what are we doing about it? If not, why? And acknowledgement by management. That's really what we need. So if we're thinking about it in terms of lessons learned, what are uh, these lessons learned? Are they not risks or opportunities for us to shore up something within our system so that we don't have recurrence of a similar problem? And depending on how we capture this stuff, we may be able to index it such that it's searchable later on so that we can um, be able to, to refine the, the data to be able to search that data later on and use it for its value, use it for its worth. Um, if we can capture the information in a single spreadsheet, that's great for a smaller organization. For larger organizations, it may be a repository in the form of a, a database or a tool that captures it, and then we've got some integrated searching features. For some organizations, this may include modifications to procedures or to training plans. Um, it may include job analysis tracking, where we have somebody audit a process or audit a workflow and assure that all of the, the intricacies of that workflow have been um, captured within the, the document of information defining execution of the task. And we certainly can't expect every single facet of it to be captured, but the more we capture that's meaningful, um, the better off we're going to be for future generations or future employees that are executing that task. Um, another great opportunity for the, the organizational knowledge um, is to, to really learn from our competitors. Um, I shared within the organizational knowledge webinar, I shared a great video from a guy named Jocko Willink, who I really, really enjoy watching. But he said, every failure we have is an opportunity for us to learn. Um, you know, sometimes we get kicked in, kicked in the teeth and we, we don't understand why. We feel pretty negative about it. But if we, get, if we get beat, it gives us an opportunity to understand where we failed and address that gap, address that shortcoming so that it doesn't happen again. And really, if we're looking at these risks and opportunities as a, a truly what they are, risks and opportunities to the business, um, and we're, we're considering those failure points to be risks and opportunities, we would implement some mitigating strategy associated with it, and we would shore up our processes such that we're not going to have recurrence in the same failure modes. So we should be procedurally addressing our process-based thinking. We should be addressing those shortcomings so that they, they don't recur. Um, Evidence-wise, again, it could be FMEAs, it could be a database, it could be some other tool um, or a combination thereof. If you have more questions on that, we again, I'll point you to that risk-based thinking webinar or to the organizational knowledge webinar because we go into that in a lot more detail. So great, great place for it. Um, that's the only question that I've got on here. Um, if there are any other questions, please, please, please type them in real quick. If not, I'll say thank you very much for attending. Thanks for allowing us to be a part of your organization. Uh, it's not lost on us that we were in your uh, in your office today that we're entrusted to, to convey this type of information to your organization. The intent here, again, really was to, to ensure that we have calibration of you, the client, calibration of our auditors, uh, calibration of candidates that are coming into the, the workforce so that we're, we're capturing some of these lessons learned, some of the tribal knowledge associated with the industry, and not using the nonconformity as the auditor is on site as a means of conveying some of these, these good practices or these standard requirements. We want to give you an opportunity to succeed, build the program for what it's worth um, before we get on site so that really through the audit process we can, we can uh, help you to drive that continual improvement that the standard is all about. Um, again, you have my contact information. If anything comes up, please feel free to uh, shoot me an email. Uh, talk to Mike, talk to uh, Katie, either any of us will be happy to uh, will be happy to answer your questions or direct the question to the right person. And if there's nothing else, again, have a wonderful day and thanks for joining us. Thank you, Don, for, for being the great speaker that you are today. I want to mention to everybody on the line again, you will be
be receiving an email with information from this webinar, as well as a survey. And Don mentioned that we want to hear from you guys as far as the next topic. So please use that survey uh, to, to let us know your thoughts on that. So thank you very much for joining us, everybody, and look forward to future webinars. Have a great day.